Welcome to reInventors in the reInvent America series, uh, where this week we're going to be reinventing government procurement. I'm Peter Leiden. I'm the host of the series and, and the founder of reInventors. Now, this reInvent America series, the entire series, all 12 of these roundtables over the course of the year, uh, is essentially focused on a theme of how can America get its technology foundation right. And in generally, the way we talk about this, it, our, our overarching question is how can technology best contribute to a thriving 21st century society that works for all. Uh, now, this is a special concern for our, our partners in this series, who we, we work on with this series, which is Tech for America, or T4A.org. This is a group of entrepreneurs based in the San Francisco Bay Area and Silicon uh, Valley, also in Seattle, that are really working to figure out how do we improve the relationship between the private and public sector? How do we actually, both sides, learn from each other and actually work out ways to work better going forward? Uh, now, this reinventing government procurement is, is really the perfect example of this, of a way that really the private and public sectors really have to get better aligned on how government buys and implements uh, new technologies. And in fact, if we can reinvent a uh, procurement process for the 21st century, uh, it would go a long way to actually America getting its, its, its uh, technology foundation right. In fact, it's probably one of the critical things that would really could drive a, a real widespread transformation in this case. Now, to help us drive this conversation and frame the discussion. We've got two anchors, not one tank anchor, but two, and uh, we're really fortunate in this one. We've got Jen Palka. Uh, Jen is the founder and the executive director of Code for America, and Code for America, if you don't know, uh, really places private sector technologists in, in uh, public sector projects, uh, particularly at the, the local uh, city level is where they spend a lot of their energy. But what's really great is Jen just came back from a, a recent stint of the last of a year working as America's Deputy Chief Technology Officer in the White House Office of Technology, uh, Science and Technology Policy. And so she's fresh from the front on the federal level as well. Uh, she's also anchored a previous roundtable in our first season here on reinventing government bureaucracy. And so it's great to have her back. But uh, again, we've got a second uh, anchor in this case too. And we're also extremely fortunate to have Clay Johnson. And Clay has really been a leader in this kind of applying new technologies to politics and government for the last 10 years. He was part of the crew, the, the founders of uh, Blue State Digital that really came out of the Howard Dean campaign, the pioneering campaign in 2004, and that uh, shop actually was instrumental in helping Obama and his historic campaign that really changed politics forever in the 2008 campaign. Uh, and he has since been applying himself more into how to apply these technologies in government. And recently he just also returned from a, a stint as a presidential innovation fellow in which he was focusing specifically on the problem of how do small businesses uh, get uh, smaller businesses actually get more government contracts, which is totally apropos to the discussion here. Now, the thing about reinventors is it's also not just about a couple folks talking, it's about the mix of perspectives to really solve a complex problem. And so for today, we've got a full house of fantastic talent. And so to really start, what we're going to do is going to go around the circle here and have everybody introduce themselves and what they bring to the table, what piece of the puzzle of procurement they might be able to help us figure out. So why don't we start with, um, uh, why don't we go with uh, Alyssa, why don't you jump in and uh, t tell how you kind of come to this, this issue. Yeah, hello. I'm Alyssa Black with the Omidyar Network. Um, I'm an investment principal there. And for those that aren't familiar, Omidyar Network is a venture philanthropy firm that um, invests in businesses with a double bottle li bottom line. So we're looking for businesses that have a positive social impact and a positive financial returns. Um, and so my background was in public service. I worked for the city of San Francisco and New York's um, mayor's office. So I come from kind of the public service background, navigated the procurement process while in government, um, and was very frustrated with it. And then uh, more recently worked at Code for America as a government relations director um, for a while there, and had the pleasure to uh, work with governments on figuring out how they could actually procure Code for America's fellowship services. Um, so I think I bring to the table uh, an understanding of um, local government challenges around procurement, and then now the civic entrepreneur side um, in thinking about um, what businesses can do to help disrupt that process. Fantastic. Great to have you here. Uh, Matt, you want to talk about how you come to this problem? Sure. So uh, my name is Matt Chandler. I'm from Palantir Technologies, and I'm the Director of Acquisition Policy over there. And for those of you unfamiliar with Palantir, we're a, a Palo Alto-based firm that does data integration and data analysis in both the public and private sector. And I would 
say that we have sort of an interesting story about our work and evolution in the federal space uh, that matters very much for this conversation. And I personally have sort of taken, uh, you know, since working in the contracting world long before I came to Palantir, a historical view of what past attempts there have been made, and there have been several, at reforming the federal acquisition system, not just as it relates to IT, um, but to the acquisition system writ large, particularly in the Department of Defense. So I'm well versed in a lot of the weird schedules uh, and components, uh, supplements to the FAR uh, that currently govern how people access the market. Terrific. Great to have you here. Eoway, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi there. Uh, my name is Yawa Ye. Uh, I am the co-chief innovation officer uh, in Nashville-Davidson County. Uh, Mayor Dean uh, created this office in July 2013, and uh, for uh, procurement in the procurement world, um, I think that today I just bring the perspective of a particular uh, effort that's really a pilot effort across four different cities, um, cities of Palo Alto, Nashville, Boston, and Raleigh, uh, to try out um, what can we do within the existing procurement rules to facilitate more efficient procurement uh, so that we could uh, actually support new technologies like mobile apps or web resources. Um, personal history, uh, I previously had served um, uh, in uh, Palo Alto on City Council and as Mayor of Palo Alto, uh, but have uh, about 10 years working in different professional capacities in local government. Um, so I'm just real excited for today's conversation. Terrific. Uh, Alex. Hey, my name is Alex Howard. Uh, I'm a DC resident. I've been a technology journalist for almost a decade now. Uh, since 2009, when I moved to DC, I've been writing about how the federal government uses technology, and uh, that has included how it's uh, built and bought it, um, and some of the various efforts that have moved through Congress, so the regulatory agencies, uh, to do it uh, better, um, more fast, uh, cheaply, ideally. Um, in a way that is uh, collaborative and not as siloed as it has been in the past. Uh, I've uh, worked at O'Reilly Media in the past, uh, a company called Tech Target. Um, these days I've been finishing up some uh, research on uh, network transparency and data journalism and uh, raising a little kiddo. Um, so I'm really interested to uh, join you all from uh, here at home and uh, get a sense of where this really important topic is moving. Terrific, thanks. Uh, Henry. Oops, Henry, you got on mute, sorry. There you go. Wow. Somebody unmuted me, perfect. <laughs> um, I like that. Um, and my name's Henry Poole, I'm, I have a firm called Civic Actions, and um, we've been in business for about 10 years, uh, building uh, technology systems, mostly for NGOs, um, probably around 200 using all open source, uh, free and open source software, um, agile you know, practices. And we decided about a year, to a year and a half ago to get into federal government work. Um, just recently got a GSA schedule um, and a prime contract about a week ago. The first, uh, <laughs> our, our, um, so I've, I've been through it. We're not a Beltway organization. Um, I didn't know anything about federal work. And um, so I'm interested in, um, you know, sharing the perspective that we had and seeing what we can do to make it easier for others because I pay taxes and I um, have kids and I want to see our government transformed. So I'm excited to be here. It's great to have you, Henry. Um, ben. Yeah, Ben Berkowitz, uh, co-founder and CEO at C-Click Fix. We're a mobile and web platform that helps citizens and governments document things that are broken in the public space uh, with the intent of resolving them. Uh, over a million issues have been reported around the world on Cyclic Fix, and about 70% of them have been fixed. Uh, from a procurement perspective, we contract with about 200 local governments, uh, and I think I've seen um, every challenge in procurement you could see uh, at the local level, um, and hopefully have found ways to navigate most of them. So uh, really enthusiastic to be here. Thanks. Great to have you here. And as smart as this crew is, nobody's as smart as everybody. Uh, we do actually encourage folks uh, who are watching this live and stream on the reinventors uh website. You can basically comment there. We'll be monitoring that, give any kind of ideas, questions. We also do it on the G Plus 
uh, link there, which you can get from our site or get to, in through the G Plus world. Uh, we will actually, again, uh, keep an eye on that and also package that in our kind of final work uh, around the write-ups. And uh, if you're on Twitter, you can use the hashtag reinventors, and we'll be looking at that too. So anyhow, uh, now we're going to go back to uh, Jen and Clay. And I think Clay's going to start off with a little bit of the framing of what, the issue and what we really want to accomplish here uh, in the ground table. Well, uh, thanks, thanks, Pete, for for um, for putting this all together and, and getting these people in this room. It's really great to get to talk to to you guys, and I'm really excited about uh, what kind of conversation we're going to be able to have because the backgrounds of of this group are really amazing. Um, before we get wholly started, I really want to talk about why why we should really care um, about about procurement. What what is the what, what you know? I don't know, I've talked about procurement a lot, and one way to get people to stop paying attention to you, roll their eyes, and potentially pass out on the ground, is to say the word procurement to them. Um, it's, it's a great way to lose an audience. Um, I, during the healthcare.gov thing, um, uh, when that was all melting down, I went on CNN like three or four times to talk about procurement, and it was CNN's lowest ratings week ever. Um, so coincidence? I think not. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about why uh, you should care about this. Uh, the first reason you should care about this is because it's really expensive not to care about this. Uh, in the past month at the federal level, I can count $2 billion worth of federal IT failures. By failures, I don't mean that they were over budget or they were not on time. I mean the money would have been better off being set on fire to keep homeless people warm because it was a total failure. Uh, the second reason why we should care is because when government isn't good at IT, people start to die. Uh, veterans are dying because we can't get our IT situation over at the VA. We've got uh, Social Security and Medicare IT problems, and if we can't get our IT act together, then it's going to end up in very catastrophic uh, 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 results. And the third reason we should care about this is because it's destroying government's ability to really do its job. As the private sector grows in its technical capacity, as it's able to acquire more uh, technology, if government can't acquire technology at that pace, that divide between what the public sector has and what the private sector has becomes really untenable. Um, so a good example of, of thinking about this is something like high-frequency algorithmic trading, right? Where if government can't acquire technology quick enough, quickly enough, how can it how can it regulate that trading? If if you're literally just if, if, if the whole game is about CPU cycles, if the private sector can acquire CPU cycles at five times the pace as the public sector can, then it will, that, that is an unregulated market um, by de facto. Um, and so uh, we all know what happens when we leave our markets completely unregulated. We've, we've just come out of a recession uh, as a result of that. And so thinking about those things of the impacts of government's ability to acquire technology over time is really quite quite um, important. Um, so that's why procurement is, 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 um, is, 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 is important to me at least. It's because it's really expensive, it, um, being bad at it kills people, and it could inevitably end up in some kind of like weird dystopian uh, society if we don't fix it. Um, so then the question is, well, what will fix procurement? I think it's important to acknowledge that nothing is going to fix procurement. Procurement is not a technical problem, it is a managerial problem. It's something that requires uh, uh, constant attention, a level of attention uh, to refinement and uh, agility uh, all throughout the, uh, the lifetime of an organization. In this case it's government, so hopefully it's mostly permanent. Um, it requires adaptivity. How you buy things and how you hire people are competitive uh, principles to any organization that need to be consistently refined. And I think that's part of the problem that the procurement reform community has is that we tend to have a lot of panels like this and we say, well, the problem is X and we get into these arguments over whether or not the problem is X or the problem is Y or the problem is Z. But 
<laughs> trying to fix procurement singularly is like trying to fix America and then arguing about whether the problem is campaign finance reform or climate change. These things aren't mutually exclusive with one another and lots of things need to be fixed. We need to be having a yes and strategy. Yes, the registration problem is broken and the set aside, pro the set -aside uh, uh, systems are broken and the past performance systems are are broken and the the uh, the the bid protest uh, 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 systems are broken. It's a big system that needs our constant attention. Then the third thing is really what is what is it that we can do? What what is it that ordinary people can do to solve this problem? And uh, there are lots of things that we can do. One interesting thing happened yesterday. Uh, Representative Eshu and uh, Representative Connolly's office. Uh, release the RFP IT Act at the federal level um, and what that does is do a lot of things to make government a little bit more agile, make it easier for small businesses to get contracts, make it easier for agencies to award them. It codifies a lot of the innovative things that uh, uh, Jen Palka did uh, inside of the administration and a bunch of other neat things. It would be nice to discuss that on this panel but I don't want to take up too much of Jen's time so uh, with that I will, uh, I will hand the uh, the headset over to her. No, you can keep your headset on, but thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, so let me just recap a couple things that um, that Clay said um, in, in different words and then set the frame for the rest of the conversation. Um, I think the way, the reason this is getting attention now, finally, is not just that Clay is very um, charismatic on CNN, which does help. <laughs> Thanks, Clay. Um, but that the Policymakers in DC have started to realize uh, after healthcare.gov, this was not the first time they've seen it, it's not the last time they've seen it, but that if you spend you know, the, an enormous amount of political will to get a policy or a law passed and, you, and it fails on implementation, their jobs are now in jeopardy. Their, or not their jobs are in jeopardy, but their ability to govern is in jeopardy. And I think that's the, the size of this crisis and speaks to why um, the average person should care. If we don't have a government that can implement the policies that it makes, we are in a bad place. Um, I think what we, uh, the, the other thing that Clay is saying here that I just want to say in, in different words are that if part of the problem is a very huge monolithic waterfall approach to technology development, and this is not the whole problem, right? There's problems around SaaS, there's problems about different problems for different kinds of things that we need to acquire. But if the problem is a monolithic approach a sol an, and an iterative uh, development process is what we're really trying to bring in, in there. We can't solve the meta problem with some, you know, one shot. There's no silver bullet for this. The solution to the process problems is also going to be iterative, step by step, um, bottom up, small pieces loosely joined. And that's one of the reasons it's so important that we not just sort of put our faith in one, you know, one master plan, but work it have uh, conversations like this, connect people like the people on this panel to each other and the solutions that have worked. Um, so the way that we are thinking about structuring this conversation maps to kind of the way we're thinking about Code for America these days, and I'm not going to make this into an ad for Code for America, but um, the procurement problem is a problem of 21st century government. Our uh, mission statement is um, we believe government can work, full stop, that's a uh, 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 a profound assertion, I think, in, the, in today's world. We believe that government can work for the people, by the people, in the 21st century if we make it so. And if you believe that statement, then there are three major stakeholders that have to come to the table with something significantly different than they have previously to make that true. And that is governments, and I think in the context of procurement we would all agree that really government has the biggest changes to make here. Um, companies um, who are going to have to meet government where if, if they're getting there, they're going to, along the way going to have to meet them. Um, and I mean a different set of vendors and also understanding how government works because it is still at the end of the day, even if we get where we want to go, going to be different probably from the way that enterprises and small businesses secure their, um, uh, their, what their needs. And then again, to Clay's point, um, we think of it as communities, but we're really talking about the public here. It's not going to happen without pressure from the public and without the public starting to understand this more because they care about their government working. Um, so we thought we'd structure, um, structure the conversation 
um, within those three buckets. I don't think we'll spend a chunk of time exclusively on each of them. I think we'll be going back and forth. Um, but a, a, a sort of another axis, I think it's really important to pull out that there are different needs in the procurement system for, say, buying a product like um, uh, like Ben's C Click Fix, which is essentially a SaaS product. The governments don't really know how to um, procure because when the federal acquisition regulation was written, there wasn't such thing as, say, the internet, much less software as a service. Um, and then on uh, maybe speaking more to, to Henry's um, area, there's also an enormous amount of custom development that has to happen for government where it's not about buying a product and making it work and just letting the, letting the company run it for them. But um, no, there was no healthcare.gov that you could buy off the shelf, but there was a, a much simpler, more iterative way you could have built healthcare.gov and, and we wish was built. And there's a different set of challenges that are needed in order to get us to a place where we can get those kinds of services. And, in, and then there's a large set of, um, of things around simply commodity IT. I need my email systems to work. And I think it turns out that the levers that you need to push to get the right outcomes in, in the different buckets actually really don't work for the other levers. And so across the board, sort of this is the rule that we need, I think isn't very effective. So I want, want the panel to sort of tease apart the different kinds of um, strategies that work for different kinds of procurements. Um, and then I, I, I think there's a set of basic things that we see um, that are working that we will talk about, but I also really want to make sure that this panel has talked about things that have actually happened. Not just stuff that could happen, but this happened here and why. Um, so I'll stop there and we will, um, Peter, maybe you can take it back and see if you want more intro here or you want to start getting to some of these examples. No, let's jump right into it. I think that was a great tee up and uh, let's, uh, who wants to just jump in? Did someone uh, right off of what Jen teed up? Don't be shy here. Who's 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 uh, or Jen? How do you? What what's a question you want to actually kind of start to start it off? Sure. Let me uh, let let me let me give it a little more framing, and then I think people will have a better uh, a better way to chime in. Um, one of the ways we think about this is that um, that th there's an old line. I think it's from uh, the Pearl community. We need to make easy things easy and hard things possible. Right now. Even the simplest thing is really hard, and the things that are actually hard in the real world become sort of impossible. Um, so there's a couple of tactics that I think about under that, and the first one is we need to be able to buy cheap software as a service as easily as possible. So maybe we can start with SaaS, since there are a lot of people on the panel I think have something to say about that, and I know Ben does, I know Clay does. Yeah, I'd be happy to kick off a response to that. Um, uh, you know, I think um, it was Sasha at City Lab that got me thinking this way about government procurement recently, and I actually think it, um, though it's it's much higher level than a single answer, it is in a way a silver bullet. Um, I hate to say that, but uh, it is a bit abstract as well. I I don't know why it is with soft, software requirements and software RFPs that, uh, especially in government, but also in business, um, the buyer defines the solution, I mean, down to every little feature. Um, and I think that really creates a ton of problems. I mean, if you um, think about an RFP for uh, a building, the, the government is not telling you what the building looks like and how many windows it's going to have and maybe even how many bathrooms it's going to have. Uh, they'll tell you how many people it's going to serve and how they, uh, what they want to facilitate within that building. Um, so I think the, the simple way of saying this is that RFPs and any type of government procurement really needs to start with the pain point um, and should not try to go too far beyond that because if you go too far beyond that, you really um, limit yourself to getting to creative solutions that really work. Um, I'm sure Code for America has experienced that uh, quite a bit. Um, we certainly experience it. It leads to all sorts of other problems that I could talk to when you're trying to bend uh, to the features that are, are, you know, being explicitly put into these RFPs. But uh, I think that's a good way um, for me to kick off what I see as as one of the biggest challenges, um, but also, um, you know, one of the biggest opportunities to optimize for. Yeah, right. from 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 uh, from where we sit over at the Department of Better Technology, we have a SaaS solution and called Screen Door, 
And I think what we've what we've found is, and this is to Jen's point of businesses needing to sort of meet government halfway. I think a lot of digitally native SaaS companies presume that their business model works like this. We're going to make some software. We're going to put a page on the internet with our prices on it, and then we're going to work really hard at being the number one result in Google for that thing, and then we will profit. Um, then we will make money. Um, and that's just not the way that government works. You know, 37 Signals does not have a... Um, an enterprise sales force, but you can't start a business in the space and not have an enterprise sales force. You can't um, not have a pipeline, a managed pipeline that you're going through in order to sell to these people. It isn't it. The idea that you know you can build a product for government and put a page on the internet and government people will just come up and buy it um, is is not it's not going to happen in our lifetimes. I don't think it's it's instead um, government expects to be sold to. There are things there are there are things in the public interest that make it so that that is what will have to happen, um, uh, uh, including you know being able to prove that this is the best value for the dollar, and you need to businesses need to work with government in order to build that case so that they have their you know uh, eyes dotted and their t's crossed, and uh, they can go back to the taxpayer and say, look, we most effectively spent the, spent your money. The problem is is uh, this this uh, relationship that government has with business um, has a very defensive posture to it. And you know, if I could wave my wand on top of anything, um, it would be to change that posture from a defensive one to an offensive one. And where government, I think, needs to move forward and move itself to is a place where instead of saying, well, we need to defend the public dollars against these thieves who are coming to us or against these young bucks who will fail and waste the public dollars and try to mitigate all the risks that we possibly can and try and, and let's imagine what failure looks like and do whatever we can to um, mitigate against what that failure is. That's the current posture of government to instead say uh, let's take an offensive posture of government and say we need to drive towards success. Let's imagine what success looks like. Let's develop a theory of change on how to get there and work with our business partners to do that. Let's presume that the people that are showing up to the table that are bidding on our projects actively want to help us. And let's work as a team to get us to the right place at the right time and have the right solution. So um, I'll chime in here to get to the point of things that are actually happening and have happened. Um, and I know two examples of cities, and I'm sure there are more, and I think Yahweh can, can, can chime in here on this, um, where city governments are saying, um, yes, we see the problems Clay just described. Um, we think we can partner with cities. And they're looking, they're looking really at two problems. One is that there are sort of categories of things they think they know they need. Um, when Philly w was looking at their fast forward accelerator program, it was things around public safety. And one example in there was reentry programs for uh, you know people leaving the criminal justice system and going back into society. Well, there have been sort of programs that have been, been packaged up for years that kind of look very similar. It's a set of trainings and videos, and I, I can't even remember what they all are. Um, that may not actually be getting to the outcome that they desire. And they wanted to engage a set of um, entrepreneurs around saying, wait a minute, we don't, we're specifying we want to buy videos for people that are leaving jail, but we don't know if videos for people leaving jail gets to the outcome we're looking for. How about we partner with you to really understand what it is we want and you can talk to us about some things that you think might actually get us there and we help you understand how to how to work with government. Now San Francisco has just done a similar thing with their San Francisco Entrepreneurs in Residence program where they worked with I believe it was five possibly six departments and um, partnered them very closely with entrepreneurs to say over the course of four months we're really going to get down in the weeds with you. You can really understand our problems. We can really understand what your proposed solution is. And we come out with something that's better for both sides. So this, I think, according to sort of traditional interpretations of acquisition policy is nuts because you're giving someone a whole lot of access. They're now obviously preferred in some ways. But in, it, it, the fact is this is the only way we're getting to um, new outcomes to get a new set of vendors interested in this problem and to get uh, 
cities be able to demonstrate that they can buy things that are actually getting towards the outcome instead of just um, checking the box that we bought this thing we needed. Uh, Yowie, do you want to chime in there? I know you've got other cities doing similar projects. Sure. Uh, I, you know, actually, this is a partnership that we had done with Code for America, and it was uh, pulling a lot of uh, from the themes that Jen just talked about. Um, from uh, the city's perspective, uh, uh, Palo Alto, Nashville, uh, Raleigh, uh, and Boston, um, we all had gone through the process of hold, holding civic hackathons before, where we loved working with software developers. And from our perspective, though, we saw the cycle of innovation over one weekend. You know, this great idea uh, pitched on a Friday, uh, this prototype developed over the weekend, and uh, you know, wonderful presentations you know, on a Sunday evening, flush with Red Bull. <laughs> and then Monday comes around, and that prototype just didn't have a home to go to. And it was uh, concerning for us, you know, from uh, a kind of cycle through these um, you know, tech funds, our concern was, what happens if software developers and uh, you know, the weekend warriors just get tired of working with open data or working with governance? And so we started talking about how we can work within the system, our procurement system, to see if we could essentially position cities as angel investors. So all of us talked about the, the idea of a competitive procurement threshold. Uh, each of us had different dollar amounts that triggered a competitive process. And what we agreed on was a, a low dollar amount that if aggregated across cities could create a, a potentially compelling pool of aggregated capital that we could then push out in almost an angel investor sense. So we all agreed that we could all put up $5,000 each that would enable pretty efficient processes within our individual cities, create a pool of $20,000. And uh, there's a website, um, the local government, we created probably too long of a name for this pilot effort. It's called the 2014 Multi Multi-City Innovation Campaign. Uh, we really need to shorten names, but uh, what we did was just to see if we could solicit ideas from software developers around you know, their own creativity. Uh, originally, we tried to be prescriptive and said, uh, here are the four cities that agreed upon needs. And what we learned was it's not easy for four cities to agree on their top priority needs around a mobile app. And so what we turned around was just said, here are some suggestions. Here are some innovation tracks. Submit your best ideas, software developers, and we're going to do our best to push out the data that you need around that particular issue. Um, and so uh, on the website, you'll see the whole kind of life cycle of this program um, that really was uh, aiming to uh, answer some of the questions of can mobile apps be you know, scaled out across cities from the design phase on? Can it be sustainable from an investment perspective where cities are providing one-way money for you know, software developers or non-traditional vendors for cities? to then create, for example, the next C-click fix, but just in a different area. And to the extent that we could move flexibly and nimbly within our rules, where $5,000 didn't trigger our competitive procurement process, that was what we wanted to try out. So where we are phase-wise, we picked a winner. It's been a seven-month process. Um, we have two attorneys, one in Boston, one in Nashville, looking at language where if we can develop a single-party single signature agreement, where it's only the developer and the developer team signing it, almost like an attestation to the governments to say, you know, hey, yo, if you give me twenty thousand dollars, I'll give you, uh, you know, the total uh, package of the, the mobile app. Um, but it doesn't necessarily require a counter signing. So if cities don't have to then sign the agreement, then that facilitates the process potentially. So it's, I, I'd say, it's still exploratory at this point. Um, our, our, our go date uh, that we really want to have something is actually for the Code for America Summit um, in the fall, <laughs> uh, just for something that we can share. But it's definitely been an effort where we're trying to uh, think creatively about how if this pilot effort works, then our ask to other cities will be, can you afford $5,000 to seed new mobile apps to be able to you know, go through startup accelerators, to go through other uh, you know, opportunities for them to build businesses around that. Matt, did you want to chime in um, with a little bit of uh, history there on the federal side of the incubation story? 
Sure. So I think it's important to note that, in fact, some similar models um, to what Yahweh is describing have been tried in various places in the government. Um, most of these, obviously, through the intelligence community and the Department of Defense. So the sort of marquee model for this that currently exists is InQtel that works with the uh, intelligence community. And in fact, that's where Palantir got some of its money from. And in a sense, InQtel is great because it accomplishes some of these goals that you, Clay, and Yahweh have talked about. It brings in folks who don't traditionally play in that market uh, to show what their technologies can do. And it's a little bit less burdensome than the typical acquisition process. At the same time, I think if you ask people historically what has happened with all of these when they translate into the federal spaces, that scaling has been a problem, right? So you can win uh, another transaction authority or OTA, for folks familiar with that, or similar things, to do you know, cooperative R&D or development of prototypes. But from a profitability, profitability standpoint, there's nothing for you on the other side of it. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that at the end of the day, the budget process and sort of the allure of doing big waterfall development projects is still the norm. So nobody pays attention to these models, even though they're in place. Um, and a few of them have even gone defunct. You know, the Department of Defense had its own thing called the Da Vinci Capital Fund. And, you know, I know sort of in a sense the 18F uh, project at GSA is trying to get into a little bit of these things. Um, and it's important to recognize that those have been tried. And so the barrier to making them work in the way that folks want is, again, this, this overwhelming preference for the agencies that have big IT budgets to build their own solutions rather than work with and buy commercial competitors. Um, and, you know, there's been a number of attempts throughout the acquisition uh, reform history to change this, but a lot of this is cultural. Um, and, you know, Jen, I think you probably have experience in addressing this and what are some of the proposed solutions that have been made to change, to change this model, right, where it's not seen as prestigious to preside over a $500 million IT program. It's actually more prestigious to preside over something that costs $10 million and actually achieves results. Yeah, I'll chime in there. I'm, I think this gets back to what Ben was getting at with the buyer defining the solution and having a whole lot of requirements for it. And I think it's an appropriate time to bring up a model that I think many of you on the, I think probably all of you on the, um, on the panel are aware of, which is what they've done in the United Kingdom with the government digital uh, service there. Um, I think that one of one of the things they did there was really fix an asymmetry, uh, an information asymmetry problem between government and the vendors by bringing in talent. Uh, but the critical thing that has probably driven 90% of the change that they saw there um, is essentially saying we are committed to one principle above all, and that's digital services that work for their users. And they are uh, sort of wryly put a little asterisk next to users to clarify that they mean the citizens using the service, not government. Um, and I think that a lot of the things we talk about here, being able to break up things up into smaller bits, agile development, um, uh, you know, reducing the requirements, iterative, all really fall under that. If you, you basically any anything you want, if you think back to are we developing something that's going to work for the user, or are we developing something that meets a whole bunch of government needs, which includes a in long, long, long list of compliance needs? Um, then you, you're generally going to get to the outcome by, by applying that filter. That is a, um, that's a strategy that involves culture changes, process changes, some policy changes. It did not, for them, involve any changes in law. Uh, it was something they were able to do with what they had. And I think it's worth talking about the different efforts here, both at the local level and in the federal level in the U.S., um, to get to those same solutions. Um, Matt mentioned 18F, which for those of you who don't know, is a, uh, um, a department or a, or a group within the GSA that's dedicated to bringing talent, technical talent into government to, to build common solutions and is to a certain degree inspired by what they've done at uh, the GDS in the UK. I, th I think that the GDS model is a good one, but it, it, um, it doesn't get government off the hook from having to learn how to buy things well. Agreed. Um, I, I think, you know, one thing that, so one thing that I did during my presidential innovation fellowship was come up with a project called RFP EZ. And what RFP EZ did was um, create a website that was 
very simple and easy to use for small businesses to bid on government contracts that were worth less than $150,000. And if you want to talk about success, I think this, this program had um, a lot of potential uh, uh, success uh, metrics tied to it. Uh, what we found in launching this pro project, which by the way took three people and probably a couple hundred thousand dollars um, and about four months, uh, uh, we launched this project and we saw a um, oh, we, we put five we put five procurements through it five acquisitions through it and we put it through the standard way of doing things which is a website called fez, fedbizops.gov and we put it through RFPEZ this new website that we built and what we found was that the projects that came in through RFPEZ um, were on average had a 30% lower bid price than, um, than what was coming in through standard means. But more importantly, we saw 250 new businesses sign up um, in order to uh, register, which I think was part of the, um, the forcing function on that price. Um, so the moral of that story to me is that there's so much room for savings and implementation, uh, uh, better implementation outcomes inside of government because, um, and, 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 and where that starts, I think, is with the registration process. Um, if governments can learn how to streamline their registration process, again, to shift from this defensive posture to an offensive posture, to shift from saying, well, we've got this set of, of vendors who are set up to take our money and fail, instead to say, how do we get the right companies to the table? How do we reach out to them and bring them to the service, even if they've never done business with the federal government before? How do we bring them to the table? Well, the first thing that you're going to think is, well, and the first thing that a business will tell you is, like, let's first lower the barrier to entry to me being able to be at the table. I just put an RFP in yesterday that made me certify that my business does not have segregated bathrooms. Um, uh, I had to certify that my software was Y2K compliant. Um, there are some things in here in terms of barriers to entry that are no-brainers that we probably ought to do away with. That's not to say that I'm pro-segregated bathrooms. It's just the case that I feel like we're, we, we've taken care of the segregated bathroom problem, and we certainly have taken care of the Y2K problem. Um, and I think, that, I think that as we sort of move forward, thinking about how to further streamline those registration processes, especially, by the way, the federal government one is pretty good. At the state and local level, these things are terrible. Um, and streamlining it into such a way where we can uh, perceive that there's a, um, a, a benefit, a good outcome, and, and assume the best in the people that we're working with, not the worst, um, seems to me like a great step forward, and there's so much savings to be had, to be had there. Clay, I keep thinking that you mean like gender segregated bathrooms, no. like Eileen McBeal style, but I'm getting that's not what you mean. No. Okay. Um, I, I want to just comment on one thing um, uh, to, to clarify what the UK has done with the GDS. They still buy a lot of stuff. Um, they, they, um, this information and skills asymmetry thing, uh, by getting some great technical talent on board in government, has actually meant that they've been able to diversify their vendor ecosystem. So they have a map of the, of the vendors that they've worked with before GDS, and it's a couple of dots on a map um, clustered around London and the map of their vendor ecosystem now, and it's thousands of dots all over the place, um, all over the UK. I'm sure they work with people outside the UK as well, but they didn't map those. Um, and I think that's because people want to work with them. Small companies don't want to work uh, with government when they're working in traditional models. They, If they believe they can actually get good work done and not get drowned and be able to produce something that's going to work for the user, uh, it's a really big deal. And I know, Clay, you saw this because you had this roundtable where you had some folks in there from a uh, well-known, you know, um, sort of consumer-oriented design firm that said, I'm still not sold. I'm not going to do this because I really want to work in the way that I know produces good outcomes. And I think, um, Ben, you've got a lot of experience with this uh, notion of what works for the citizen versus government. Do you want to chime in there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was happy you mentioned that. Uh, we we always think of C click fix as citizen first. In fact, I mean that's that's in our nature and our founding story that we designed a platform that was deliberately for citizens first. And when we started working with our first client, the city of New Haven, um, you know they had uh, an enterprise. Um, it was cloud hosted, but um, 
a web solution for for trying to receive feedback from citizens. And they had to be really proactive about asking citizens to join a volunteer program to actually report. And at the same time, Cyclic Fix was launching, and all of these reports were coming in. Uh, and the the city was really smart about this. They they looked at Cyclic Fix and said, well, all of the tools for government may not be there on the back end. This is solving the problem of citizen communication, which is what this platform is designed to do. And so. Um, they came to us, and we were unsure, you know, if we could really, if we wanted to be in the business of building back-end software for governments. And I think what we've learned over the years in partnering with governments is that you're really not designing anything much differently. If it, the, the differences are not as extreme as you may think between designing something for a citizen and that's functional for a citizen user and is functional for a government employee because we're all humans and... Um, you know, basic design principles work. Uh, the the key though is that if you start at the government and work towards the citizen in, in respect to design, a lot of times because the government is paying the bills, they can control um, the way that is weighted uh, to their unique experience inside City Hall. And so it's important as a third party to really play um, to, to balance that well and to, to get out of the way so that your communication platform can be an unbiased solution for really solving problems, not just making one of the parties right or wrong or better enabled to communicate than the other. You really have to play that, that unbiased third-party role. That's our responsibility. Yeah, and while you're talking, I think we want to um, talk more about that sort of enterprise sales side of it in just a minute, but we did start out talking about being able to buy cheap software as a service easily. Um, quick question for you, Ben. How many of the cities that you've worked with had a policy in place that enabled the purchase of SaaS? It's a good question. Um, you know, I don't actually know any... May, yeah, that's not true. Maybe there were three or four cities that had a SaaS explicit policy. Mm -hmm. um, but all the other cities that purchased with us were able to purchase under the restrictions of their existing purchasing process. Um, they're, they're some of the bigger cities who had become accustomed to things being inside of the firewall had issues early on. Yeah. Um, some of them contracted with other companies that, that uh, met those needs. Um, I know some of the CFA fellows have worked with those folks um, or worked in those environments before. Um, but, you know, the nice thing about working with most towns and cities that are not like the top 25 biggest towns and cities, that they hadn't really ever thought, most of them had not really thought about setting up policies to be scared of a lot of the things that cloud could possibly bring. And so um, I found that we, we kind of saw those phobias, and I really do think they're phobias, uh, early on, uh, mm -hmm. and these days you don't see them as much. So partially because people just jumped right to the cloud and never really had anything sitting on the inside the firewall that was designed to connect with the outside um, and also because uh, because okay. um, you know culture is shifting um, government quicker quicker than we might have expected uh, yeah so a di slightly different answer than I expected but um, but certainly um, well taken we had seen that here at Code for America where the lack of a policy or template contract that supports SAS has been, if not a barrier, like a long-term barrier, at least a delay. Mm -hmm. And it's a problem for, for companies who are doing that. And so I just wanted to start there. One of the things that um, we are doing Code for America is a project called the Open Procurement Standards Project that's supported um, by Alyssa and her team at the OMDR Network. Um, to the extent that cities are asking for a template RFP with recommended language around um, SAS, a template contract with recommended language, and then sort of an explainer document so that the, everyone can kind of have in plain language, this is why we're doing this, this is what it means. Right. Um, we're doing that also, by the way, for government website branding and identity. Um, it's just the, the thing that we've sort of put our toe in the water in and found that there's this common problems, um, much like I was talking about these, these common things across cities that we can help. Um, but having said that, let's move off of the SaaS topic yet and, um, and move to Henry. 
uh, to talk a little bit about, I, I think, um, first of all, I think you wanted to, to talk about the role of open SaaS, but also um, the other barriers that come into play when you're not when you're when you're doing custom development generally on a on a larger project. Um, yeah, w uh, just to, to throw in about open SaaS, um, it's really exciting to it's ex exciting to learn that a lot of cities are are adopting <laughs> SaaS and new emerging technologies. Um, we haven't worked with any small cities, and we're doing all custom development, so it's been a little it's been different for us. It's been the barriers have been very real. <clears throat> On the other hand, it's pretty scary <laughs> to think that the a lot of the cities are just using uh, SaaS um, because there's a lot of data um, that gets inside these systems, and not to have any policies and not to have any um, understanding that they may be getting locked in. That's a scary thing from the point of view of a you know taxpayer. So I think. Having some policies around that would be really useful, and having some standards um, towards, um, you know, open, uh, free and open source software first, and in particular the open, open SaaS, being, ha having um, policies in place where you can move if you need to move your systems. Um, so, um, <clears throat> but um, a lot of the conversation so far has is, is, is been around. Uh, Package software, software that's being sold, um, and most of the most of the expenses, most of the investments in technology that I'm aware of, I think 60% is in custom development, and that's really the business that um, that I've been in for some time. Um, and I've you know I spent the I spent the 90s um, building you know services company uh, for uh, Fortune 100 companies, building their internet systems, and then last. Ten years, I spent, you know, NGOs and building platforms for NGOs, and we just decided to move into the federal and government work, um, and it's really complicated. Um, I and I I found there's so many parts to it that, that are complicated. I think the biggest the biggest thing that I've noticed in the federal in the federal space is, you know, just you know, talking when I'm talking to procurement people is just believe. Believing in them, <laughs> you know, telling them, you know, trying to get them to share with each other what they're, you know, that they have ideas and and just to believe and understand their the complexity that they have because there's so much polarization inside the government that the people are angry at the at the people in these different agent or different departments and it's just that that whole thing about just the polarization is really stopping the creativity. Because they are, I mean, we found really creative people. You know, we're working with a, a defense security cooperation agency, uh, this peace uh, partners for peace platform, and they they've been very creative. But it's really hard. It's really hard for all of them. Um, and you know, one of the things I would love to see, and I haven't seen it yet, is some kind of an open process. You know, like a where people are actually sharing what's working with procurement. Um, where different people could get together and share the best practices, because we're there. Are people who are doing really innovative things with all kinds of, you know, uh, cycles. Uh, you know, selling cycles. Um, there are people selling function points and trying to and figuring out how to do these things with, with agile. Um, and it's just people aren't talking about it. They're siloed. Well, that's a good. That's a good segue into um, to my favorite unicorn, Alyssa Black, who um, who uh, you know. Has worn sort of all of the hats uh, that are necessary to see a whole picture here. She's worked inside of government. Um, she's worked inside of Code for America, um, and now she's um, she's uh, 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 at Omidyar investing in uh, these kinds of companies that are uh, trying to to sort of make a difference. Um, and Alyssa, I'd, I'd love to get your take on on this about how uh, the companies that you're seeing are, um, are, are, are selling into government and, you know, what it's like to be on the other side as to, you know, being sold to. Um, because I think your experience here is probably more comprehensive than a lot of everyone else's. Yeah, one of, um, you mentioned earlier, Clay, enterprise sales, and so that kind of struck me because that's something that we've been talking a lot about with the entrepreneurs. Um, in the civic tech space is, you know, if you're in a startup and you're getting money to do growth and scale early on in your um, 
company's life, how do you dedicate resources to sales and biz dev? Um, and particularly for those civic tech companies that are looking for local government customers, it's super tricky, right? Because there are hundreds of local governments and then you could increase that to county and then to, to state. And I think Ben has obviously firsthand experience in this. Um, and so thinking about, um, and I don't have a solution for this, it's something that we're still looking for, but I, I love um, Yahweh's example of coming together and collectively purchasing things. It's If there were some sort of um, kind of driving force that, that helped new civic startups um, kind of do sales to government, um, that would be an interesting thing to explore because I think that's one of the biggest challenges. When we see the, the hockey stick growth, the question is how the heck are you going to make this happen with government as your customer? Um, on the flip side of that, coming from government, um, a lot of what Ben um, talked about resonated with me around um, kind of going after the uh, or being sold to, I guess, Clay, you said that, that government is used to being sold to and where does that leave kind of new startups that are looking to be agile and and potentially pivot as they get to know their customer better and so some transparency around the problems that government faces. Um, Jen mentioned the uh, entrepreneur residence program that San Francisco has and I think that was a really wonderful way to embed entrepreneurs into government to um, really understand the problems that government's facing so that they can take their product to the next phase which is hopefully opening a whole new market which are, is government. Um, and so I think there's there's a lot of challenges. I think some cities are doing, um, have really great examples on like a small scale. On the state and federal level, um, I'm a little bit less connected to that space. Um, but I have seen really wonderful partnerships form. Um, Henry mentioned Open SAS. There's Open SAS seems like a way to get into uh, the government market space. Um, and thinking about um, creative partnerships that get you past, and Clay, you're probably familiar with this, the federal regulations to actually um, launch software in government, um, coming up with some creative partnerships with, <laughs> with companies that have figured that piece out. Um, so that's another thing that we look for is like, who as a civic tech company and as a startup, who are you leveraging that, that has experience in this space? Yeah, I mean, it's that's the regula the regulatory part is really sort of, you know, a thing in and of itself. Um, but again, you know, the I think the topic of this conversation we've really got to stick with how do we get new players involved and how do, how do we how do we um, how do we get government attached to the level of innovation that the private sector has gotten. Now, the regulatory part is a lot of that, but it's sort of like you've got you know government is on a in a house on a mountain surrounded by barbed wire with snipers on the roof, a, vulc a lava pit around it, and then an alligator pit around that. Um, let's worry about the obstacles to get people into the house before we worry about whether or not the, um, the oven is properly calibrated. Um, For sure. And um, I think that goes to transparency around what's uh, around opportunities. So your innovation fellowship uh, right. project is an example of, I mean, my question that I wrote down while you were describing that was, um, was that a, a function of you having a better marketing uh, knowledge around how to get that information out to the world so that you got right. more responses and the design of your tool, or was that the actual um, bids and RFPs that were available? So I think Alex, Alex, you um, have been a um, active participant. Uh, in this space for a long time, both as an activist, as a blogger, as a writer, as a thinker, as a um, objector, um, sometimes just as a Twitter arguer. Um, I can go on with adjectives. Um, uh, I have no no shortage of adjectives for uh, Alex Howard. But um, what uh, what are you seeing in terms of as someone who sort of covered the space? What are you seeing in terms of what's succeeding and not succeeding uh, for governments? Have you have you looked at any um, local uh, local success stories that maybe we're missing here? Well, I think I'm seeing a lot of things that are good and bad. Um, the bad news is that the failures at the federal level continue. And one of the uh, points that I think a lot of people maybe miss sometimes in this conversation is that 
Um, if we're talking about the scale of these failures, people should be a lot more upset than it seems like they are. Uh, this issue with Social Security Disability System, a Lockheed Martin getting a contract for $300 million and it not working and being years behind. Can you imagine if Social Security had spent $300 million uh, sending people out to get people registered for disability benefits using a pen and paper and pad and came back not having done it? Right. Um, and yet we're not having uh, the kinds of hearings that I think might be appropriately leveraged. Um, thinking of the profiteering back in World War II, um, you know, because we're seeing that scale of spending, $80 billion a year going out of the federal coffers from like 40, 50, 60 billion at the state and local level without the people that are paying for these services getting the return they need. And unfortunately, that seems like it follows, uh, falls unfairly upon the Americans who are relying upon these systems, many of which started out as e-government systems and now are digital government systems, because we're talking about IT procurement, and aren't getting served well. Um, DMV software is, you know, kind of uh, the, the low-hanging low fruit. Everyone always talks about them. But everything from uh, food stamps, which Code for America has worked on, um, to other kinds of housing benefits, uh, welfare, you name it. And I, I think that uh, I'm seeing movements towards approaches that get the kinds of services into people's hands literally um, that they need in terms of, of working with uh, uh, innovative companies that provide mobile technology for instance. Um, but there's still not a, a level playing field um, for people to bid upon really big projects. And when I've gone out west to Silicon Valley or traveled to other countries and, and talked to entrepreneurs who've built you know, billion dollar companies, even million dollar companies, um, about um, these kinds of projects, they think, well, I could build that for a tenth of what it actually appears to have cost or, or less. Um, but I couldn't get through the process or I didn't, know, didn't want to deal with the process to, to bid on it. And, you know, my sense is that there are a lot of really creative approaches out there, but they're often not necessarily engaged um, with the people making the decisions. Um, there's a really old saw that goes around uh, the federal IT community and lower communities as well, on state level, that no one ever gets fired for buying Microsoft. You could say that about IBM, and you could say that about HP, and you could say that about a number of vendors uh, who've been in this space for a long time, along with systems integrators who build their systems and put, try to patch them all together. And I think there's got to be a, um, a, a more developed way to insulate the people making these decisions against the risk that some of the projects won't go well. Otherwise, the system won't change. Um, yeah, it's a, that's a, that's a, it's a really interesting point that um, that no one got fired. I always heard is no one ever got fired for uh, hiring IBM, but it, you know, same thing. Um, the the that's not to say that those vendors are bad. It's just to say that those that, that the, the inertia goes to this level of entrenched vendor that often excludes. Um, the smaller, more innovative companies, uh, uh, to an extent, and maybe part of the problem here is that um, you know everyone that has approached this problem so far has either approached it as a nonprofit or someone working inside of government. But they've, ne but it has yet to be the case that someone has made this IT and procurement issue a political problem for someone. Um, Yep. And and perhaps you know maybe an outcome of this roundtable or maybe an outcome of of you know the next few weeks or something like that. Perhaps one of those outcomes is to you know start a political coalition that starts making this a bit more of a liability uh, from a public standpoint for these decisions to get made. Because um, the the fact is is that no one I'll, I'll I'll let you talk again in a second. The fact is that no one wants for two billion dollars to be set on fire. Um, that's six dollars per person um, in the United States. So almost seven. Um, but anyway, Alex, I'll, I'll, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just wanted to hammer that home for a second. Hammering is sometimes important. Uh, you know, we, there's going to be an opportunity for there to be a national conversation about this in the fall when Congress gets back. There's a couple of bills before Congress. One is the ungodly acronym of FATARA, which tries to reform some things around the chief information officers. The other is this bill that was just introduced this week that I've covered um, called RFPIT. Um, it would do a number of fairly sensible things that appear to have worked in the existing administration and codify them. The Presidential Innovations Fellow Program, which Clay participated in, the creation of a digital government office somewhat like the GDS that lives inside of OMB and has the current USCIO at its head. 
um, looking at IT Schedule 70, uh, thinking about bumping up the smallest contract that uh, you can uh, use for IT to, I think, a $500,000 uh, 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 limit, which should make it, in theory, easy for government to buy these bigger projects. It's basically scaling RFP easy, Clay, from what I can tell. Um, it, it looks like a good bill. It's got bipartisan support. It's just a bigger question about whether this Congress is willing to take the Sturm and Drang and upset that the nation felt uh, last fall after seeing healthcare.gov you know, go down and wondering what the heck, why can't government build a website, and had it again when the FCC website buckled under people trying to leave comments on it, um, or the social security issue, or the, the litany of areas that people um, should know about where we failed. Um, whether popular upset then pushes us to at least work in this little thing, which is the legislative issue, and then maybe put a bit more attention on these other ones. Uh, it's just going to be a matter of whether uh, Republicans want to make it a political issue and the administration wants to take it on as saying, here, we're doing something about this in a very public way. Um, and my sense is that a lot of the popular anger has been muted because of other things that have come up, uh, notably immigration. Um, but I'm hopeful that maybe the media will serve the people a bit better here on this and say, um, these are some things that have been tried. Here's some proposals to codify them. Um, why don't we do something that's thoroughly common sense? Uh, whether Congress acts that way is up to them. Yeah, it's it's important to note that no no public policy that I can think of, no major policy initiative that I can think of that's on the table either by Republicans or Democrats doesn't come with a major IT component. So, you know, with healthcare.gov, you know, with the ACA, it was healthcare.gov. With immigration, it's this $1.2 billion uh, Im putting immigration forms on the internet catastrophe. Yep. Um, uh, every single, uh, with, with, with um, climate change, it's about reporting of, of, of emissions and stuff like that. But Matt, you had um, some stuff to add, I think, about a GAO report um, that, uh, that you wanted to chat about. So um, let me send it over to you. Sure. Well, you know, as you know, the GAO gets regularly dragged to the hill to testify every time there is a big failure like healthcare.gov. Um, but in private conversations that I've had with folks from <clears throat> the G GAO, as they've surveyed the landscape of solutions that are out there to prevent uh, failures like that and to open up competition to more innovative companies, they've said, you know, while there's a lot of components uh, to the reform debate, one of the simple things that's missing is basic accountability. And that if you were to bring an agency CIO or sort of equivalent person of stature in front of Congress and ask them in the past six months or the past year, kind of from an agile development perspective, what have your top 10 IT investments actually delivered capability-wise? And they literally cannot answer this question. And it's actually something that I think probably should be asked more frequently because I think you'll find, you know, in terms of getting new models for how the government procures and develops software in there, they will only do these things if they feel an existential threat like healthcare.gov, right? And they never feel an existential threat unless there's some kind of pressure from the outside on them. And that's where Congress can play probably the most impactful role. Um, certainly there's some things to be accomplished legislatively. Um, and I've, you know, Clay, I know you've worked on that. I've worked on that a little bit. But from a perspective of getting folks to just basically have the right incentives to deliver capabilities at a reasonable cost, you need Congress asking the questions. And the public itself can play a role there too, right? Because in a sense, Congress will respond if people care that almost a billion dollars was spent on healthcare.gov. Um, and, you know, fortunately, there's nonpartisan examples of this too. You know, maybe folks are familiar with the Air Force's Expeditionary Combat Support System. We spent a billion dollars on that program and got literally no usable code out of it after almost 10 years in development. And not one single person was fired. The contractor made more money because it was a cost plus contract and the taxpayers are all on the risk for that because of the nature of the contract. That should be something that is elevated in the public conscious to get Congress to play its proper oversight role. And I think if there's proper oversight, you'll actually see changes in culture and changes in behavior that get a lot of the things that we've been talking about previously. I'm going to chime in on that and um, I'll start by saying I actually really agree with everything everyone said but I want to play a little bit of a devil's advocate to this um, question of oversight. Um, first of all I think if you think as I do that a big thing that we could do, not a silver bullet by any means, but a big thing that we could do is, is encourage 
uh, government agencies and cities and states to when they are building a digital service, it needs to be you know it isn't something they can just go buy like a C click fix product. Um, to break it up into small bits and to use the um, basic tenets of agile development, and, um, then we really have to think about what goes into that. And um, first of all, I guess I would say what I saw in federal government was that the CIOs know what they're doing doesn't work, don't like the outcomes, and literally don't know what to do within the confines of their, um, you know, the, the the constraints that they see around them, the compliance needs, um, the oversight needs to do something that's fundamentally going to be different. Um, they they are you can't sort of manage a process better that just doesn't work. I mean, what they're they're trying to do is sort of double down on a bunch of oversight pieces at the CIO level that just don't really work because they're trying to better manage a waterfall process. The waterfall process is not going to get us where we need. It fails 95 percent of the time in the federal context. So they, first of all, there's just a level of blocking and tackling that we need to do to show that there are, that A, Agile is legal, it's actually preferred, um, and that people in federal government are doing it. So to the point that we need to be able to show that something else is possible before that's a realistic path for someone, we've got to highlight folks like Mark Schwartz in uh, Department of uh, Homeland Security. He is at Citizenship and Immigration, who is, you know, the burden of, of um, uh, the implementation of immigration reform is going to fall on his department when and if that ever happens. Please let it happen. But... Um, and, and he's done an amazing job over the past two and a half years to take some enormous long-term monolithic contracts, break them up into small bits, and give them to a set of, I think it's like eight or ten vendors that are doing each bits. And um, if I'm, I may be incorrect here, but I know this is true in another um, federal context for a contract. The unit, the de unit of deliverable in these contracts um, can be a sprint. So that's what blow many contractors' minds, right? Like you have to know all of the features of the software that you're going to buy before you buy it. Otherwise, you're not serving the citizens. Otherwise, you're writing a blank check to some crazy coders who are going to code whatever they want, right? That's, that's the perception that gets in the way of us contracting with companies in an agile manner. But there are agencies that are doing it, there are cities and states that are doing it, and if we don't sort of hold those up and say, guys, this, it's not just what you're doing is wrong, it's that there is another way and this actually works and it's hard. So he didn't just go kill a contract and get new contractors, it took him two and a half years to kill a very, very large contract and get that money, it's only now being sort of applied to the, this um, more diverse set of folks that can that can that can work in, in a in a uh, in a more coordinated fashion with these sprints, where at the end of each sprint they decide what worked and what didn't work. Now, what's the next thing? Which is the which for anybody in the software industry reflects how software that works gets built. Um, but that takes a really long time, and I I do fear to this point of oversight that oversight requires that knowing everything that is built beforehand. The whole mantra of oversight, the whole way that conversations happen in DC is, you need to tell me right now what you're going to do four years from now. And oversight, we need to have a really deep dialogue, I think, about the train wreck of traditional, you know, the traditional frame and of an overkite conversation and how agile software development really works. And we need to not just hold public, uh, public CIOs accountable when they're trapped in a system that doesn't work. We actually need to go support them through the process of being able to say, you know what, I don't know the answer to that question because currently it is unknowable. That's not something you can say in DC and not get fired right now. Conversation stopper. You can get fired in DC. Well, you can, <laughs> but maybe not for the right things. A lot of people do get fired. Um, I, you know, maybe I, I, I take it back to Henry having sort of done this kind of work. You know, are you guys able to get contracts with your agencies that specify uh, or allow for the principles of agile development, and how did you get that? 
Um, yes. Um, a year and a half ago, we came into a project uh, that was 10 years old, um, and it was kind of messy. They were using pretty much waterfall, uh, or trying to, and, and over a period of the last year, we uh, educated the uh, you know, program officer, educated the team on agile practices, um, and eventually um, they, they put a procurement out um, three or four months ago, and that we landed the we landed it as a prime as our first prime contract. Um, it, it, it took a long time, um, and they don't they they still don't really necessarily know exactly how it works. Um, they really trust the process though, because we've been in the last year and a half we've improved the the deliverables. We, every release we've done has been on schedule and budget. Um, so they they appreciate the quality of code. Quality assurance practices. They, they appreciate that you know we're meeting deadlines and so forth. Um, so they and they, they believe it's oh it's it's agile has helped. Um, the one thing I think that's most important, if there's anything that we could do, is like is the retrospective. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I, we've been doing for I've been doing in 20 or 30 years in software development. It's like that concept of taking a break, <laughs> like just taking a break and saying, well, what worked. And what didn't work, um, whether whether it's whatever you happen to be doing, if it, even if it's waterfall, it's helpful to just take a break. Um, but I think there are certain things that we could do that would be extremely helpful. Um, Agile doesn't always work either. I mean, especially you know if you've got people trying to implement it and they don't know what it is, or if right. you don't have you know if you have to people cha things changing all the time, or you have requirements or interfaces that are 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 str you you're. You can make a mess with anything, basically. <laughs> um, so it's not the solution necessarily if you don't apply it properly. Um, but um, it certainly does. It, it certainly, with the changes in technology, with the the emerging the emergence of new technologies, there is no there's no you. I can't imagine anybody planning a two year project. It's just completely ridiculous. Yeah. It, it's it, just it, ridiculous. The, the the other I think disconnect here is I, I also wear a different hat other than at the Department of Better Technology. I also wear a hat as senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, and part of the research that I'm doing there is just asking companies that aren't doing business with the federal government, "Hey, would you like to do business with the federal government?" And if their answer is yes, another question I ask them is, "How much of your revenue is um, derived from responding to RFPs?" Um, and usually that answer is zero. Um, it seems like the um, the public, the private sector, um, has really done a good job of of creating a marketplace that exists without an RFP process almost entirely. Um, and I know from from my work at the federal level, um, uh, the RFPs that I've responded to. The only ones that I will respond to are ones where I was in discussions months before that RFP was released. Um, because if I'm just finding out about a deal when the RFP comes out, that means it's already wired for somebody else. That somebody else is, and that may not necessarily be a bad thing. Somebody else has already put in the time and work educating that potential client with um, what it is that they need to do in order to be successful. Um, but, you know, it, it calls to question something that's, I think, vital and important, and and something that doesn't get asked enough. And, and though it tends to be a a um, a little bit of a radical notion, it's um, is this process um, worth anything at all? Is this procurement process worth anything at all? Um, and should it be? And and how is it defensible in any way? So, in other words. Um, uh, uh, would it be better just to give everybody, you know, a trash bag full of money and say, here, go buy things, do with it what you want? As that tends to be the way that the private sector works. It works through, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, it, you know, it, it works through social buying. I guess that is a better word than cronyism, which is I know a guy who can do this, and so I'm just going to go to them and ask them to do it because I know that they're going to do a good job. And in the private sector, that's all but a, all, all but, but, I mean, that is, that is sort of, uh, pushed aside and and usually frowned upon and and pretty illegal, um, but there's another side to that, which is that great talent comes with good people, 
Um, and the regs that we've created have basically said, we know that you have an expertise in your career and you come with a social network that can be an asset to our organization, but you're going to have to not talk to those people anymore mm -hmm. for the sake of um, fairness and equity. And I just wonder how we, at, at what point, you know, do we begin to say, well, wait a minute, this is a... Um, this is this this system that we've created now isn't really defeating any form of cronyism, and in fact, it it's making it very difficult for us to have good, high quality, productive outcomes. Um, so, a question I'd ask to the rest of you is: Is this a you know, is this notion absolutely insane? Um, and how do we defend this current model that we have? Um, and how do we make the the model of sort of government uh, uh, procurement defensible at all? I, I can. I'll jump in real quick. I, I I've read Far for the first time a year ago, um, and I really there are a lot of things I really appreciate. Um, you know, the there's um, equal employment. There's a whole lot of really great things that I like as a citizen and as a business guy. I like seeing it. I like seeing these things. The requirements. Um, I like that. There's you know that there that we can move funding into um, minority-owned businesses or into a particular zones where we need to see economic development and people need to have jobs. Um, I, those are really valuable things to, that I think are really important. Um, small businesses, you know, we're a small business, we're not a DC business, but, you know, we were able to respond to something and we didn't have to compete against, um, you know, IBM on the, on the procurement. In fact, they, they, they would have to come for a small business to, 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 to try to, to partner part, part with us. So the, the, I think there are benefits to it. There's also, there is, some, there are there's the other side of it too. And I don't think there's a, I think what we have right now is not, it's not working. But I don't know if it's, I don't think, I don't, it's not that it's not all working. Parts of it are not working. Um, and, you know, and, I, and I actually think, and I, it, when I think the biggest reason personally it's not working, I don't think it's because we don't have the right solutions and we don't have the smart people. I think we're just stuck in a, in a particular way that we're fighting and looking at each other. Um, and it's just like I, when I had to cut this conversation with the procurement team two days ago um, here in D.C., it was like I said, there's this thing, a Chinese finger puzzle, right, where you stick your fingers in this thing and you can't get them out. You're just, you're stuck. Um, and it feels like that they spent a year and a half trying to get a procurement done, all of them. And it was just so complicated, and it took so much effort. Um, but you have to have faith. We have to have faith. And, and we have to. The people that are, are scared to come out here or that don't think it's worth it, getting into the government work, it's like all – we have to roll up our sleeves and believe that we can do it, and we have to go here to the to, you know, Beltway and say, look out, you know, we're – we're going to change it. We have to transform it, and we have to want to, and there's, there are people that are here um, that are interested in it, but you have to believe in them. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that, and I just want to return to something I said earlier about iteration and, and, and to the earlier discussion about legislation. If we do legislation in this area, you get one shot at it, and um, it's probably not going to work the first time. And that's my real concern. Not that we shouldn't do it, but that I really want to think of it in that context. The law of unintended consequences is a you-know-what here, and, uh, and I do worry about that. I also think that what I saw what I saw when I was working in federal government is that procure, you know, uh, Mike Bracken in the UK says procurement is for pencils. You can buy something that exists, right? But when you're trying, all systems that work, all digital services are things that, I'm sorry, Clay, you're misunderstanding me. They still procure, I still think we should procure. I'm not making an argument for insourcing. What I'm making an argument for is putting together systems that have to evolve over time, have to always evolve, that are not about what you ship on day one, but the fact that this stuff needs to get updated, the fact that when, as a consumer, you know, my Google Maps gets better at telling me how to get from point A to point B every single day. Um, the fact that we are not creating systems that are designed to continuously improve is a really, really big problem, both at the level of the digital services we create and at the level of the procurement systems themselves. And so 
the, I'm just going to continue to go back to what are the small things that we can do to move this forward that are small bets that we can try that aren't, you know, we're going to package everything into a piece of legislation because we think that's going to fix it all. Though we obviously, I am a huge supporter of legislation that fixes the key things that we know are wrong. Um, I, I, just, I just, I just, I just want to like the reason why I, I, I raspberry procurement is for pencils is because again it's a cop out. It's we have to get good at buying things, and we can't just say, well, no, procurement is for commodities and not everything else. It's just not the case. We yeah, that's not what he's. To, we've got to, we've got to get good at buying things, um, and we can't be dismissive of the process by I saying, think, well, it's just for pencils. Well. And, they continue to procure a lot, and, and I don't think anyone's saying that. I think what they're saying is that the current system was designed to set up to buy discrete things, not things that need to get better over time. But I take your point. Um, I think it might make sense to go back to the panel here and just talk about, again, what are concrete things that are going on um, you know, today, tomorrow, next month that we should keep our eye on if we care about this issue. And I think we do all care about this issue, and I think, Yahweh, you had one. Can you unmute? Yep, just unmuted. Uh, so um, I think just to share kind of what we're thinking about in terms of next steps for the multi-city effort, um, really this was a pilot effort in the sense that we are partnering with the Vanderbilt Computer Science Department um, to seek grant funds to see if there is a possible online platform uh, for us to scale this out. And our, our hope across these four cities was that if we can demonstrate that cities can work together around group procurement, um, what's to stop them at any number of cities working together if they have a problem. You know, the idea behind this uh, grant that, that we work together on is imagine an eBay marketplace, two-sided marketplace. Um, cities are on one side, they self-organize. Uh, yeah, that's relevant to that particular problem. And then they share the dollar amount that they're able to pay for a solution that's below that competitive procurement so that they can nimbly move forward with it. So for San Francisco, for example, they're 100,000. For us in Nashville, uh, we are 10,000. So cities can bring what they can to the different solutions that they're seeking to encourage more software developers to uh, then you know, be allowed in on the other side of the marketplace to see, oh, you know, there are 20 cities that are putting at a minimum $5,000 up. That's a $100,000 capital pool. So I'm willing to try to develop some kind of solution for these 20 cities um, and then be able to push through something where ideally, again, it's a single signature um, efficient process that doesn't require a, a, a countersigned process that then you know, triggers a lot more processes we can make the government. So that's what's next um, for us within our multi-city effort. That's, that's fantastic. Um, I think with the time we have left, um, we'd love to get sort of last thoughts from everybody. We have to keep it super brief. I did mine on iteration. That's sort of my <laughs> final point. So uh, maybe we could uh, start with Alyssa. Yeah, um, I think this gets back to something that you mentioned, Jen, which was if we're not going to uh, necessarily spend all of our time pushing through the legislation, what are the, the small kind of wins? Um, there are a lot of local government officials that are creating workarounds. There are thresholds in each city um, that allow for certain types of procurement, mostly SAS. And so kind of getting together, share, having more conversations like this, I think what's Code for America's leadership, um, sharing what works. And um, and sharing that not just among local government officials so that we can understand which each threshold is in each city that we, we've seen successful civic tech uptake, but also talking with businesses and getting conversations with civic tech entrepreneurs started where they're sharing best practices, or not even best practices, but how to get stuff done. Any um, practices. And, yeah, any practices. Um, and, and begin to have that conversation among the civic tech entrepreneurs. Fantastic. Ben, you want to go next and be brief? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the most successful procurement process we've been involved in was through the state of Massachusetts. They have open innovation grants uh, through the governor's office, and uh, the city of Boston was the initial facilitator of implementing C-Click Fix across 60 towns in Massachusetts. It started with 20, then 40, then 60, uh, and it was so successful that a year later, uh, last week, they expanded the program uh, and actually passed the facilitator relationship over to another agency 
uh, that is a metropolitan planning agency. I think if there are cities or states that are interested in this, um, this idea of innovation grants, open pools of money that don't necessarily mm -hmm. um, say what they are for, uh, that can create a lot of opportunity and that should definitely be replicated. It's been very successful. Yeah, that's something every municipality should be doing. I totally agree. Alex, totally. final words? <laughs> Alex, you're muted. Uh, building and buying tech uh, and doing innovative work. I, I've highlighted one of them at Tech Republic not so long ago at, at Open FDA. Um, that's something that's going to be really important to millions of Americans, uh, getting uh, adverse events uh, out uh, in terms of uh, all the things that the Food and Drug Administration um, receives complaints or has concerns about. Um, we have to make this more of a political issue so that people at every level of government understand how bad services that are facing their citizens actually come to be so they actually are invested in fixing things for their constituents. It's not an abstract, government does this badly. It's, it's my problem that government does this badly because I was sent to represent these people and this system isn't working for them. And uh, part of that also is to fight against a huge amount of cynicism about government, including serving in government. Um, one of the things that I am seeing that is working is including uh, people who've worked in technology, who've worked in the private sector, who have built things coming into government. Um, ATF is inspirational in that context. There are ways for them to work otherwise, innovation fellows programs at HHS, at CFPB, at the White House itself, um, in different cities that are trying that approach. Um, is a way to get people more, more exposure. Notably, though, I don't think a lot of CFA fellows are going on to work in government. Um, and we need to think about that as a pipeline in terms of building the next generation of public servants who will understand technology and be able to make decisions working with the private sector and hopefully um, oversight bodies that understand the, the systemic issues that are leading to endemic IT failures in government. Um, if this doesn't become a political issue, um, then everyone in this conversation has at some level failed because it matters so much to the people we care about in terms of our children, our neighbors, and our parents who are entering off into broken systems that aren't serving them well. If we think the systems themselves need changing, that's a different level, different kind of political action. But given those constructs, I think we need to ask our country to do better for us. Totally agree. So we, we need, we need a, a, a real organizer on this. and. Alex, I think you may be part of that. Well, there's a community organizer in chief who's going to need to speak about this as well. And he needs to be part of this conversation. And, you know, Jen and, and Clay, you've been closer to Barack Obama than I think anyone else sitting here. Is he committed to this as an issue that he's going to actually put his political capital behind? Hey, Clay, maybe we'll actually, you know what, why don't we hold that question uh, and go to Matt first. And I think Clay may have something to say about that in his wrap up remarks. But okay. Matt, you want to say something? Sure. So, and this is some way uh, related to, but what, what you know, what uh, Alex and you have said, Jen. So, for better or for worse, there is going to be a big sweeping acquisition reform effort next year done by the House and Senate Armed Services Committees that will affect IT in drastic ways. And I have to tell you right now, there is very little, if almost no, participation from outsiders to the system who are talking about some of these issues that you guys are talking about right now. I would urge, and maybe you guys have already done this, so I apologize if you haven't, but I would urge Code for America and individual companies to submit comments to them ahead of that effort because they're taking over comments from industry. Um, and again, as Jen said, they're only going to get one crack at this, and if they don't have the right voices telling them how they should be taking a crack at it, the outcome is not going to be good for folks. Because right now, how does, how does one submit comments, Matt? Yeah, uh, I can I can try and follow up and send a portal that we can maybe link out link out to people. Um, uh, and I should have I should have that link with me right now, but I don't. And um, maybe Pete, we can put that in the in the in the vid, in the video at the end of this. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it'd be great to have a place like Code for America submit comments because right now the only people submitting comments from industry are the big uh, traditional defense contractor industry associ industry associations. Great, we love that. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, Henry, a uh, quick last thought, because we're a few minutes over. Oh, yeah, I, I, I echo what other people have said, Lisa. Sharing best practices. If, if we would just have uh, procurement toolkits that we're kind of, that we start to share, that would be awesome. There's, there's also standards around data. You know, we've got all this open data happening. 
if we had some shared standards, and I know there's some stuff going on around that, people um, sharing standards, but that could help a lot of entrepreneurship and investment at a local level. So those are my only things. Totally agree. Um, I guess I'm the last one left. You know, I would, besides Jen, I don't, to answer your question, Alex, um, I think that the scope of changes that need to be made and the time that it takes to make them um, extend beyond, uh, far, far beyond the remaining time that this administration has. So, you know, I think, and, and Jen, I don't want to scoop you here, but I think that it's going to be up to our first female president to solve this problem, President Polka. Um, <laughs> and all... <laughs> um, and the, I, I guess the other, the last thing is what people can do to affect change right now is to call their member of Congress and tell them that you support the RFPIT Act as it stands right now because it's a very important bill and if it passes it could make a lot of changes. Great. Um, if there is going to be a president who cares about procurement, then I will model the re correct behavior by reading out loud from the e section uh, no, 1.02-4. Really? The FAR outlines procurement policies that are used. If a policy or a procedure or a particular strategy or practice is in the best interests of the government and not specifically addressed in the FAR, nor prohibited by law, executive order, or other regulation, government members of the team should not assume it is prohibited. Rather, absence of direction should be interpreted as permitting the team to innovate and use sound business judgment that is otherwise consistent with law and the limits of their authority. Contracting officers should take the lead in encouraging business process innovations and ensuring that business decisions are sound. I really just wanted to end on that because that is the law of our land, and I think it's, while there's a bunch in there that keeps us back, there's stuff there that, that puts us forward. And thank God she waited till the end to start reading. <laughs> exactly. Everyone's oh, I like that. That was beautiful. <laughs> but, uh, uh, ending it's, with the FAR is a great way to do it. But thank you so much, Peter. You want to end? You want to wrap us yeah, up? Yeah, I'll just wrap it up. And thanks for the. Uh, that was the, the Declaration of Independence, or where were you reading that from? Let me think. No. <laughs> Federal quite. Acquisition Regulation, <laughs> twenty five hundred pages. <laughs> Anyhow, we uh, we have gone a little bit over, but it's a fascinating and very complex problem. Uh, this really did actually clarify a lot of things. We'll be doing a short video, a shorter video version of it. We'll do social media optimized video. We'll also have a write-up on a synthesis of this. We'll also take the best comments off web uh, and put it in a storefy. So thanks for everyone who was here on the roundtable. Thanks for everyone who watched this and contributed their ideas. And uh, thanks particularly to our two anchors, uh, Jen Pucka and uh, Clay Johnson. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Bye.